Before I start, I just want to say thank you so much to the Center for Fiction. Thank you so much to Houghton Mifflin, all of these wonderful people who have just gotten me to this moment. Um, and more than anything else, thank you so much to my friends, my family, all of the beautiful faces that are staring at me right now. It's a lot. It's a lot. I may cry. I am 90% going to cry at some point today, just so you guys know. All right. So we decided I would start by just reading a little bit about this um, from this book. Just to give you all an overview, it's basically a multi-generational story of a Palestinian family. It starts in the early 60s with the family's matriarch in what is now the West Bank and follows the family's trajectory over like half a century. Um, and each section is written from the perspective of a different character in a different city in a different point in time. So I'm gonna read a little passage from the perspective of Manar, who is one of the great-grandchildren of the original matriarch at this point. Um, she is the first member of the family to return to Israel and, Pal and Palestine since probably like two or three generations. Um, so this is her experience after several weeks being there. She recently found out that she's pregnant. Um, she's in the coastal town of Yaffa. She walks away from the party. It is late, she thinks. So late it is nearly early and soon the sun will begin to rise. She walks until she reaches the cobblestone street, little pebbles piercing her feet. For 10, 15 minutes she keeps moving until she cannot hear the music anymore, away from the beach, between houses, until she finds a secluded looking archway between two trees and finally she sits. She remains there for a long time, as though in a trance, until the low thrum of the mu'advin stirs her. Suddenly she is aware of everything again, the sky beginning to lighten, her filthy feet, the growl in her stomach, even the contents of her purse are jumbled around, her phone has run out of battery. But here, yes, here is the zippered pocket, the bundle of paper, her grandfather's letters that they found years ago, she opens them for the hundredth time like an archaeologist afraid she missed something all along. She goes through the pages until she finds her favorite passage, a letter written to somebody she never met, a letter that was never sent. Last night, it begins. I dreamed of refugees stealing rubble, a woman's braceleted hand, somebody's eyes. I dreamed of the men in Zorka, the camps, Army bases all over America, they met in secret rooms, these men. Unfolded maps and pointed, grooming for war, they woke and stamped outside in boots. Their rage woke them. It marched their legs up trails, snowdrifts, sand dunes, their breath precise and measured with each step. And the land urged them, onward, onward. They aimed their rifles at a target, imagined an enemy heart and pulled the trigger. Impulsively, Manar begins to read aloud. Her voice is hoarse from the singing earlier. She thinks of the play she used to do with her brother and cousins years ago, imagines an audience listening in the empty archway in front of her. But Mustafa, she says, we still thirst for it. Our mutiny is our remembering are remembering the hundred names of that land. This is what it means to be alive. Finally, she packs the letters away and rises grimly, walks down the street until she finds an unopened store and pauses, checking her reflection in the glass. It is disheartening. Savage hair, droop mascara, she scowls at the reflection. She finds herself suddenly aching for the sea again, walks the narrow streets, past shuttered beauty salons and bakeries, makes a turn, and there, pale in the early light, the water waits. Yaffa. There is that desire, that old wanting, as old as she is, to say something, for someone to bear witness as she speaks. I've come here for no reason, she whispers. She begins to laugh, no reason at all. The laughter takes on an edge of hysteria and it occurs to her that she might cry. 
She walks along the shoreline, the water icy against her ankles. It is beautiful, all of it. The hastening of the waves, how the water gathers itself as though spilling white petals onto the sand. The sky has the colorlessness of moistened paper. It looks like it might tear. And the sunlight touches everything, spinning it into gold. Her tired mind alights on myths, Icarus, the stories she spent years memorizing, everything she has forgotten. She sits abruptly, the water lapping her skirt, a testimony, she decides. On the wet sand, she starts to write letters with her finger. Alia, she traces, her grandmother, and then writes her grandfather's name. She draws a line between the two of them and another one, a family tree, the only one she will ever see. Karam, Suad, Riham, her mother, uncle, aunt. Next to her mother's name, she writes her father's, then draws an X between them. A handful of stars like white freckles are still visible in the sky. She writes her name, cousins, brothers. Looking at them, she speaks again. We were all here. She holds her wet palm to her cheek then runs it through her hair. She imagines her whole family standing on the shoreline in a row, oddly cheered by the image. She pulls her knees to her chin. We were all here. She draws a final line from her own name. Below, an arrow that leads to a small question mark. Leah, June, Dada, there is a human, she realizes, that she will have to name. Shutting her eyes, Manar tips her face towards the sky. When she opens them, an, a man and his young boy are walking along the sand, watching her. The man has a fishing net hoisted around his shoulder, dirty gray knots, he is frowning. A mixture of disapproval and concern on his face as they walk closer to her. The boy's face is beautiful, a docility about his eyes. He stares at Manad, openly curious. Yalla. The father says in Arabic, nudges his son. He eyes Manad warily. She is shaken with a desire to protest, to speak with the man in Arabic, but she can see herself through his eyes, drenched, squatting in seawater, her American clothes, not a woman in the throes of revelation, but something peripheral, another unnecessary foreigner. Ajnabiyya, she can hear him thinking, Westerner. This is what makes her drop her eyes. It is what pulls her up unsteadily, the wet skirt clinging to her legs as she bows her head in apology. A large wave suddenly crashes over the sand, the water eating her words, her family gone and come and gone in the sea that belongs to none of them. I'm leaving, she says to the man in Arabic, and Araiha. As she walks past them, she glances up only once. The man is still watching her, but his expression has changed. She nods, and the man nods back. OK. Hi. Hi. Um, so interesting, because so, so rarely as an editor do you read reread a book that you've read as a manuscript. Um, in, in many different incarnations, and then actually sit down with the hardcover book and read it again as, as though you, you've never seen it before. And this has been the greatest pleasure, revisiting this book. I really, without having to have a pen in my hand or anything like that, <laughs> it, it is so beautiful. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the lines that you just read in that, in that um, chapter, our, our remembering is our mutiny. Um, I, I was thinking about, I think I even marked it in the book that you, you just read. Um, I was thinking about that in the context of another line from the book, which is, nostalgia is an affliction. And I wonder how you see those two ideas going together. If they do go together, if they contradict each other, if it's a tension that, maybe it's the tension that animates everything. I think it's one of those dialectical things where it's not either or, it's both and. Um, I do think that in diaspora, in displacement, memory is a dangerous thing. 
and longing for things, being nostalgic for something, especially a place, can be a really dangerous thing. And I, and I think it's something that you see all the time, right? So memory ends up getting passed down through generation. And so you find in entire generations of people who are nostalgic for things that they never came across, that they've never even seen, they've never touched. Um, and I think at the same time, when it comes to diasporic experience and diasporic memory, I think remembering is an act of protest in and of itself a lot of the time. Right, and it's it, the, the, the section that you read is so interesting because I think she, she does go back to the homeland kind of poised for revelation mm -hmm. and then is surprised because it doesn't come the way she expects it to. Right. Um, and then it comes in ways that she doesn't expect right. it to at all. Um, and of course she's perceived as an outsider and she then feels compelled to speak in the language to make her an insider. Yeah. But that's, that's another, that, that's a, um, leads me to my next question, which is how, how do you think that, how do you yourself feel like an insider and an outsider? If you do, I'm just projecting, but. I think, I think I've started to feel more like an insider regardless of what physical place I'm in. And this comes after a long time of feeling like an outsider no matter where I was, right? So like I would go back, I, you know, I lived in Beirut, but I spoke Arabic with a Palestinian accent and that kind of alienated in a certain way and that sort of, it marked me, right? Like as being different there. Well, you know what, before we go there, yeah. why don't you tell us your whole background? Because okay. I think that will be very, just that will be, I'm just presuming that everybody knows this. of our closest this. friends. But honestly, let's people just don't open know. It up. So yeah. just, let's just hear okay. it. All right. We don't need every single city. I'm going to tell you take everything. us all night. Yeah. But <laughs> on a rainy night, the basics. my mother and father decided. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so my I was my parents met and married in Kuwait. My father's both parents are Palestinian. Mother's father is Palestinian. Kind of by way of Lebanon, they ended up kind of getting Lebanese passports. My mother's mother um, was Syrian. And so they met and married in Kuwait. When it was time to give birth to me, my mother had the foresight to, everyone here from the Middle East knows this, so in that part of the world, you get what your father has in terms of paperwork. And so in my case, my mother had a Lebanese passport. My father had Palestinian papers, travel documents, um, and so if I was born, I would have gotten that kind of automatically. Totally randomly, my uncle, my mother's brother, was studying at Southern Illinois University at the time. And so my mother packed herself up at like eight months pregnant. And she was just eight months pregnant, brown woman, went to Carbondale, Illinois. They let her in no problems. Was, her, was your father there today. too? Yeah, yeah, he went okay. to, yeah, yeah, I kind of made it sound like she, just, she okay. left my father, Bye. it looks like I'm getting, no, no, they all went, okay. like my grandmother went, my okay. grandfather went, my grandfather recorded the, it's like a whole thing, it's like all documented, <laughs> yes, so like she went, went to Carbondale, um, gave birth to me, I was there for like the first week or 10 days of my life, and then I left. And you went back to Kuwait. Back to Kuait. And back to Kuwait. And then we were in Kuwait. We were in Cyprus. And so that means you had U.S. US citizenship. citizenship. Which becomes relevant. But your parents when, did not. Mm -mm. Okay. They have it now. Okay. Um, but it became relevant when Saddam invaded because we went to Syria for a little bit and then went back to the States. And my parents applied for asylum in the States. But me having a passport helped sort of oh. make that process smoother. Wow. Yeah. And then was in the States, Midwest and Maine, and then come middle school moved back to the Middle East. I was in the Emirates, and then I was in Tripoli, and then I was in Ramana High School. Um, <laughs> and then I did my undergrad in AUB in Beirut. And then you came back. And then I came here for here. grad school. Yeah. And you came back here for grad school. Mm -hmm. OK. Now talk to us about grad school and what you do in your day job. OK. So I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I, I came here to actually do a master's at Teachers College, and then I decided I loved psychology. I'd always was going to do law. That didn't work out. Um, and did my doctorate at Rutgers. Now I do clinical psychology. Okay. I teach and, and I do private practice. Tell us how you came to write this novel as an accident. <laughs> I wrote a short story. Um, I guess it's relevant to say that I've always felt poetry comes easier and is a lot less of a rushed, part. like I, you just sort of, for me at least, I kind of wait for it, I can wait until I'm inspired, I do it whenever it feels right, 
I will never write anything if I wait until I'm inspired with fiction. So like it required much more foresight. So in this case, so what I made was, you even want to do it? I don't know. I've always written. I've always written in some form or another, right? Um, I think of like, they're like the lost years of late teens, early 20s when I was struggling with some addiction stuff. My entire life before that, read and wrote voraciously. And after I got sober, read and wrote voraciously. So I do think it was a way of also making sense of that period of my life. Um, the poetry was always just an easier way to do it. And then I started to get hungry for kind of longer projects and being able to express things a little bit, like put more detail. Sorry, I keep catching people's eyes. I'm so happy you're all here. Um, <laughs> so like to, to be able to develop ideas a little bit further. And in this particular case, I it started as a short story of a young man in Palestine post-48, pre-67, um, which is a period of time that I'm very interested in. It was very tense, but there's still a lot of hope and people didn't really know what was going to, was going to happen. And I was writing the story of this guy and I realized I was so curious about his mother and about his sister and I just found myself so kind of in love with this family dynamic but also sort of heartbroken for them because I knew the Six Day War was coming and they didn't know the Six Day War was coming they were probably going to lose their house and how could I abandon them? It became a whole thing. <laughs> and, and so before I knew it, I was just like I'm kind of writing backwards and looking at the mother and where did she come from and then started to write forward and that's kind of how it happened. And, but, and then can you describe the process, the actual writing yeah. process? Yeah, so the process itself started towards the end of my dissertation. Um, I was very burned out with what I was studying. And I start, like, kind of found a system where I could sort of reward myself for doing academic work, either academic reading or writing. So if I did a certain amount of work a day, I kind of earned 30 minutes of fiction writing. And it just, it stuck. So I, I did my 30 minutes this morning. So like I just do 30 minutes a day as much as I can. And then over time, it became this. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's what Which everybody is, has no, to start but doing. See, I know. And Tomorrow it sounds morning. like this like sort of oversimplified thing. Don't get me wrong. It's like, it's a lot of work. And then the editing is a lot of work. But I, I think different people do it differently. I know writers who can, and I applaud them who can sit and write for like five, six hours at a time, I've never had the attention span for that. So for me, it's like just enough every day to feel like I'm exercising that part of myself and that part of my muscle. And then I try to leave each 30 minute writing session on a cliffhanger so that it's so something like, that so you wanted to, to come back. back to the next right. day. Yeah. Right. So it's like, this person's about to sleep with who? And but then so, like I leave it and I return to it. You the know, next day. what's interesting is that in, I mean, in diaspora and in there's the, the characters in this book are jump, are, are, there's so many dislocations, and mm. there's so much chaos in interior and and geographic and political and exterior. Um, and narrative is really something that gives shape throughout the book, and it sounds like in your life too, because it sounds yeah. like the only time you weren't writing was kind of a chaotic time yeah. where you were doing something else, but it was probably taking the place of, right? I mean. Totally, yeah. No, I mean, I was a kid who like loved the Weather Channel and professional wrestling. <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of friends, really. Like, this was literally my work. Like, those were the two things that I was most passionate about. And then I read. <laughs> and then I, like, wrote. So, like, I, I also think, like, you move... The kind of moving that my family did, which was almost every year in a different place, in a different city, and oftentimes wildly, like, Texas to Oklahoma to Maine to al Ain in the Emirates to Tripoli in Lebanon, like, all of these sort of very disparate places. So a lot of chaos, there's also, it's very disorienting. Right. It's easy to feel kind of depersonalized in that setting. And then writing and narrative becomes a way of reclaiming ownership right. of yourself within this place that feels like it has no, you have no control over. Right, it. because you are portable. You always you're totally have portable. yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and you always have stories. Right. Right, like it's, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have, I guess even, you know, you don't have to learn, you don't have to know how to read, but like, I think if you're able to have a certain way with language and a certain access to skills and to paper and to pen and to computers, like those things can become portable too. And you know, it's funny because I think, I think in the original draft, that one that before that I, I, we, I remember we wound up talking about, oh, you know what, I think there should be some sort of unifying thing that's mm -hmm. kind of like a thread mm -hmm. throughout the book to kind of keep all these characters and locations and time yeah. periods. Because so, it's a very ambitious book, and it, there's so many characters, there's so many places. Um, 
And when you're in each chapter, you're in it. And, and you don't think about anybody else. And you don't think about the other stuff. Mm -hmm. But then when you change chapters, you think, wait, how, how many years went by? Why are they right. here? Who is this? Um, but, and you said, oh, you know what? In a different incarnation, I had these, I had this, these letters. Mm -hmm. um, and you put them back in, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just, rereading it now, I just thought, it was, I'm so happy they're there. But especially because at some point, the person who writes these letters to, I'm, I'm, I mean, can you just no, like, spoiler. I, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but, but tell us, but, you can say but, all of it, of but what I thought was so interesting is that it, it's a character who's no longer with us suffering, but, but that's who, that's who it's being addressed to. Right, but right, right. the person who's writing them has severe trauma from a very horrible experience that he happened, that, that happened in the previous, in the, where he had lived before. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to put his, he's trying to get back on board with his family. Um, and, and, and go through his life, but he has nightmares, and it's it's really painful and really mm -hmm. horrible. And a, he has a doctor who says, "Why don't you write?" Mm -hmm. He says, "Why don't you write letters? Right? This yeah. will help you organize your thoughts. It will help you externalize it." And I thought that's a really interesting kind of injunction for th this entire book is kind of that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, and in, in in that sense, Michelle was my my doctor who was like, "You need to find something that connects these people." And then the letters sort of came out of that conversation, but it was also the most, the easiest, like there's probably not a psychologist in the house who hasn't heard of like telling mm -hmm. patients to think about writing letters or writing things down or trying to organize themselves through writing. And even if those letters don't get sent, like I say this to my own clients all the time, like if, if there's, if it seems like it might be helpful to write something out, it doesn't it doesn't have to be read by the other side of it for it to be powerful. Right. The act of writing it in and of itself can be really cathartic. Right. Um, but on a meta level, the whole book is an act right. of that, right? Like right? It's an act of bearing witness and an act of kind of right. trying to honor and, and do justice to things that came before me. So that, that question of the act of writing is such a solitary, it's such a solitary solitary act and it's a creative act that comes from one person but you're telling the story stories that belong to a group of people to a collective mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that there's some tension between that between those two things and I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit definitely I mean I think it it's been very from the second I signed with my lovely Michelle it has felt very surreal and from the second I signed with HMH, that's also felt, felt very surreal and like it, it's happening to somebody else and I can kind of see it, but it's like through a pane of glass and it's not really mine and et cetera, et cetera. And it's taken me up until like a week and a half ago <laughs> where like I dreamt very like vividly myself kind of explaining something to somebody else and then being like, I need to write this down, where I was like, oh, that's why it's been hard to absorb the praise. That's why it's been hard to feel like this is an accomplishment that belongs to me. And I do think a lot of it has to do with the fact that this book is the result of generations and of tribes, and it is a collectivist effort that created something like this and, and resulted in something like this even existing. But then publication, reinforcement, praise, review, are very individualistic, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's very like one person gets all the praise for a thing that in my case feels like it was the result of everybody that came before me. And I don't say that lightly. Like it's, it's the, I mean, it's the result of everybody in my family coming but together. I, but then to take it, mm -hmm. please, does, does it ever feel like a betrayal? Which part? All of it. <laughs> no, I just, I mean, like, it must not be so easy to give yourself permission to write these stories. I, you know, nobody in my family knew I didn't use the word novel for a very very long time until like there was something to show for it right and so I would refer for a long time to a longer project that I was working on I would keep it very vague um I'm also superstitious so I think I didn't want to jinx myself but I was just like there's this longer project this long and this longer project was like 500 pages at right. Some point, right and I was like it's just this thing and I it took me a while to be able to even affix that word onto it um because it did feel like there were times where I didn't know if it was my stuff to tell. Right. And and again, it's not, and it's not that there's like personal family stuff in it. It's almost Palestine is such a 
an enormous thing that I do think there's always a risk of being misinterpreted as trying to be representative right. of it. Well, you know? to, and I have to say that that, to, to me, you know, I, I mean, I have, and I pro I'm probably not alone as a reader, I, I, I'm really resistant to and I mistrust um, fiction that has an agenda. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't want to read, you don't want to read about mouthpieces for any sort of, you know, ideology. It's boring. You read the newspaper for that. No, no, you know, I don't mean to offend any newspaper writers. But, um, <laughs> or, Is it your husband? <laughs> yeah, sorry, Rob. <laughs> um, <laughs> down with the news. Um, no, but you read fiction to kind of to, to kind of experience the full gamut of of human emotion and right. human experience. Right. And even though it is the description of the book, it's intrinsically political in some way because it's such a fraught subject mm -hmm. in so many ways. The the minute you start reading it, that's diffused because these are human beings who are ambivalent about they're not they're not cutouts they're not cookie cutters and mm -hmm. there's there's tension in each individual life and each individual self. And to my mind, that is why this book is so incredibly important, not just so wonderful to read, which it is like four or five times, I can tell everybody, but um, it, it can, no matter where you are, where, no matter where you're coming from, it, it touches you. And you know that's something that politics can't do. It's something that even like, you know, people who have like a religious, pulpit can't do. Mm -hmm. It's like that, they're like, they have a hammer in their hand and you have like this tiny laparoscopic scalpel or mm -hmm. something. I don't know if that's the right mm -hmm. phrase, but that just, it's like this very nimble, it's very nimble fingered and it gets in to everybody, everybody's heart, wherever, mm -hmm. wherever they are. Um, I don't know what, where that came from actually, sorry. Thank you. But <laughs> I appreciate welcome, it. But I really don't know where that tangent, I don't know where it launched no. from. Um, I mean, I will say, like, I think there, I think that it helped to write something that I really believed for a long time nobody was going to read. And it helped that I was able to trick myself. Right. Like, my first reader was Jenna. Um, Who's wonderful. And she, like, so, like, when I gave the first person who ever read it this thing to read, I was able to kind of trick myself and be like, only Jenna's ever going to read it. It's just going to be me and Jenna. We're the only people who are ever going to know the story. And then when it went out a little bit further, it was like, only me and Jenna and my friend Madeline. And then a little bit further, it was like, only me and Jenna and, like, my agent. And then it went, so it was like, I, I was able to kind of trick, till this moment, I didn't believe that all of you are going to read the book. Like, I can't, it, I sort of, because I think, I think the task is a little bit paralyzing if you... Have to if you zoom out, yeah, right. and right, if you think right, about right. specific people, like, yeah, it's it's a lot, it's right? A lot. Well, I also, I mean, I think to 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 speak to the kind of how it it doesn't feel like a political tract in any way. Um, I think you're writing not you're not right. The historical moments are kind of in the background. I mean, they're catalysts for things. They're catalysts for moves, and they're catalysts for some in some cases traumas in many cases. Mm -hmm. Um, but really it's about people caught in the jaws of history. Mm -hmm. And that's, all of us are kind of born into families and religions and towns and villages and whatever, and we're given certain particulars, but it's also what we, what we make of it mm -hmm. and, well, and I think how we navigate it. Like, this is also a family that had the socioeconomic means to leave, right? and a lot of people don't have that luxury, and I think that's an important thing to think about in terms of refugee crisis, crises today. Um, I also think it's one of those things where it's like a conversation about literature can't be a replacement for a conversation about politics or a conversation about politics, totally. right? And so right. like, I think that, that it, I, tr I hope that the book is exactly what it says it is and doesn't try to be any more than that mm -hmm. and it doesn't try to be any less than that. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because I yep. think it's, I do, th and, I, and people will project stuff on mm -hmm. different things and that's totally understandable, but I do... I agree with you. I mean, I think it was important for me to write a story that kind of paid tribute to the stories that I grew up hearing, both within my family and families around us, um, which is about a family that's ordinary and extraordinary because of their quirks and all the things that kind of make them who they are. Mm -hmm. And it's happening against a political backdrop, so there's not, like, trying to be unflinching about that and trying to not pretend that it's not there, um, but also sort of paying tribute to the people first. You know, I, I also think that um, this concept of 
inherited trauma mm -hmm. is something that I feel like we've talked about um, yeah. a few times. And I, I, was, I was thinking about it in terms of the marriages in the book, actually. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that's something that you could talk about yeah. a little bit. In terms of people marrying to escape, well, you know, just like because how, how it plays out in the in the, yeah. you know, I, I, I guess because each individual, all of us, we all have to, you know, work through our own stuff and grow and evolve in our own ways, and then to do it in tandem with someone else is extremely hard. Yeah, and when you add yeah I this layer, yeah, it's nearly impossible. Yeah. To, to be true to yourself and to the work you need to do and also have a family and be true to your parents and be true to your husband and your children. Absolutely. And to me, that's it's such a strong thread that it, it's never heavy-handed, mm -hmm. but it just runs throughout the whole thing. I th You know, and I think everybody reacts to trauma differently. Everybody reacts to displacement differently. An interviewer asked me something a couple of weeks ago that made me realize something I'd never thought of before, which is... A little forward of her, but she was just like, how is it played out in your parents' marriage? I was like, I can't answer that on record. <laughs> but then it got me thinking, and now instead I'm just going to say in front of all of you, but one of the things that I hadn't really put together before is that when it came to displacement, when it came to Saddam's invasion and the inherited trauma that occurred on both my mother and father's side, but they kind of been, were born into or saw when they were younger, that they took it and they made very different things with it. And mm -hmm. so my father can't stay still very long. Mm -hmm. He moves very a lot. He has a hard time staying in one or one place for more than a year, two years, maybe three years. Um, there's just something about settling mm -hmm. down in a place that just feels very uncomfortable for him. My mother loves to nest. Hmm. My mother loves houses. She loves architectural digest. So interesting. She loves to buy things to put in houses and, and is constantly like, it's a little bit morbid, but we'll just be like, this is a piece of jewelry you'll give to like your daughter's daughter when I die. And I'm like, mom, stop buzzing, don't say that. But like, there's like a very, like this mm -hmm. idea of, she didn't have a wedding dress that she could give me to wear on my wedding day, right? Like that was lost. And so this idea of like, we're gonna recreate it, we're gonna reclaim it, we're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna build it back up again. And, and my his... father's like, I'm not gonna get attached to anything again. Right. You know? Right. And so I, th I do think that that's something that maybe not super consciously was playing out in the yes. marriages and in the families where it's like, what do you do when, when people want completely different things right. after seeing their lives upended? Right. What do you do when their ways of putting themselves back together are at odds? And it's, it's something you can't anticipate. I don't think people know how not. it's no. gonna play out. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thinking about something with Suad, am I pronouncing mm -hmm. that name correctly? And just how she, you know, I think her, she has, she, the, she's the third daughter, she's the third child of, how it, you want to just... She's the, okay, so Selma's the matriarch, Selma's daughter is Alia, Alia's youngest daughter, so Selma's youngest daughter is Alia, Alia's youngest daughter is Suad. And Suad is, she's like a wild child. She's a free spirit and she's really a firecracker. And her mother was kind of like that too. Mm -hmm. But they are just at it, at each other's throats all the time. And Alia just, oh, she just cannot handle this child at all. And then she overhears her husband saying like, oh, I've never met two people who are more similar, you mm -hmm. know, and she, it's something she's never, ever thought about. Um, but I think one of the things, it seemed to me that one of the things that frustrated her is that you know, the farther you get from the source, so like Salma or the, mm. you know, you, I, the, the connect, the connection changes. I mean, the, the yeah. continuum changes. Totally. And there was a part of me that felt like Alia was watching that happen and just couldn't control it. Yeah. And it was all of her own internal stuff that she couldn't, that she worked so hard to control. And then her daughter yeah. wasn't and didn't have to. And it was infuriating. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but so I wanted to talk about kind of how things play out in the generations and kind of going back to the grandmother mm -hmm. um, because the person who is the connection to the lost home is a matriarch. And when she dies in the book, it's a real, I mean, I, it's, it's something that I know. I know you're stepping closer because you're like, I don't want to make you cry. Yeah. But I know no, you had a similar experience yeah. Yeah. recently yeah. where yeah. your grandmother died. Yep. Um, just this month. She passed away two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yeah. And... <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, it's still very raw and not super processed, but I can say 
my grandmother was an incredible person who, in a lot of ways, her fingerprints are all over this book. And she, she had dementia for almost a decade. And so she never, she never knew I was writing this. She never got to see it. She, she will never see it. But I do take solace in that idea that the center that she provided, I do think has carried on in, in certain ways. And it's been really interesting after her passing to see the utter chaos that my family has descended in, um, the utter misbehavior that some of the older generations have kind of descended in, and the way that I would say the younger generation has sort of had to step in and try to be more stabilizing. Mm -hmm. Um, which happens in the book too. It's which like you, is you so, really like. I know it's a weird it. life and art, art, and art and life and all of it. Yeah, it's it's. There's a, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> to be happening at once, but I do. I mean, I think it's been, and one of my friends sort of pointed out to me kind of what what it says about a person that when they pass away, even when they in a lot of ways haven't been there for so long, that when their physical presence is no longer there, that the entire family falls apart. What does it say about that person? And what does it say about what that person's role was right. in this family? And, and then what does it mean to, to take the memory that we, the younger generation, have sort of inherited and, and rewritten and kind of reconceptualized and played with and filled in the blanks with? And, and how, does that, you know, how does that carry on with, with the family? Well, I was going to end with a question, which was, um, what is your definition of home, but I think you just answered it, because I think it sounds like it was your grandmother, it's and it sounds like it was it's that for your whole family. It's like what I take with it, and, and what I take of her in other places, and I think it, for my entire family, it's kind of each other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, everybody. Now, I think we should open it up to a few questions, maybe? No pressure, if you have questions. <laughs> About the, let's say that again. Uh, being marked in Beirut for the Oh, 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 um, thank you. I, yeah, I think that, I think really what I was getting at is I, I don't think that there has been a place where I felt fully like I'm there and absorbed and digestible in my entire form top to bottom so that even in Beirut, it's like the accent kind of gives you away. Um, even with family, it's like, well, you're the American cousins, right? And then you come here and it's like, well, you're not American enough. And it's, I think it's sort of, it, I, I think that I've become a lot more comfortable in that borderland, emotional borderland space. And so I would say that I, I, I'm starting to feel a little bit more insider no matter where I go because I, maybe because I anticipate the outsider feeling and can have, inter I've sort of internalized that as part of what makes me who I am, and therefore, I don't know, maybe I'm rejecting places before they can reject me. <laughs> I'm my father. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Just having amazing insights while I'm on the stage. No, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear you say that it started out as a story about a man, because mm -hmm. I certainly very much see it as a story about women. Mm -hmm. um, mothers and daughters and sisters and generations and matriarchal inheritance and all totally. of that. Um, and then in the end, you were just saying sort of like, is the matriarch make the sense of home? And so I guess I wanted to ask you about gender in the book. Like, do you think it could have been a patriarch or is that like a totally different? I think it could. I mean, I, I kind of think of Asif as somewhat of a patriarch, but in a very different way. I think he's less heavy handed. So I think like the, the, the men in the, fa in the family of the book tend to be a lot softer and tend to be a lot less heavy-handed and maybe a lot less abrasive, um, which I think has its own kind of power. But I do, I do, yeah, I mean, I think without even realizing it, I was just creating these very difficult, unhappy women. She's like my favorite kind of woman. Yeah. Like, but I think it was happening regardless of, yeah, it was, certainly wasn't conscious, but yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey. Congratulations. Thanks, man. It's good uh, to see you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm curious. You know, you talked about your writing schedule of 30 minutes a day um, and how fruitful that was for you. But I know that recently you went on to the writer's retreat. So I'd like to hear a little bit about how that 
complex of your process, uh, whether that's going to be a new avenue for yeah. you in terms of your creative process. Thank you for asking that because that's a good point and one that I forget about. So I've done two residencies. This was my second one. And the first one I did last year at a moment in my life when I was very spun around. So it was much more of like me coming back to myself and like taking long walks and petting dogs that weren't mine. Like it was, a, it was like a much slower <laughs> process. This is the first time I've done, I've had uninterrupted time where I went with an agenda. I was like, I'm gonna finish this poetry collection that I'm working on. I'm gonna put together these short stories. I'm gonna try to work at least it's not even that much. I was like, at least an hour a day. So I changed my half an hour to an hour of the fiction. But I did, I was actually very proud of myself for being able to sit at the desk and try to attend to whatever it was I was doing, whether it was writing or reading or even just organizing, which in and of itself for me is like probably harder than the writing, um, for at least like a few hours. And what I hope to take with it, obviously, like, grandmother, publication, book tour, all that's a little bit jumbled, but I hope to kind of return to it, is I found that I was really enjoying writing poetry right before I went to sleep, which I'd never done before. And so I'm hoping to kind of go back to that. Yeah? Hi. Um, Hi. Congratulations. I haven't read it yet. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I, I sort of had a tiny bit of practice with it when the poetry book, came, like the books came out and I had done like a TEDx talk and I had recordings of me reading poems and everything is searchable, right? And so in my training, in my doctoral program, I know there's other psychologists here, I don't know what it was like for you guys, it sometimes felt like what we were learning about privacy and confidentiality and self-disclosure hadn't caught up yet with the fact that there has been this like explosion of people can find anything you've done very quickly. Um, I try to address it when it comes up. In this particular case, because I had to travel so much for things, I'm going to have to travel so much for things related to writing, I have disclosed to, to some people, namely the people who came to me in private practice through writing. So one of the things that in, is in like you can, like if you find a poem of me online or a story or whatever, at the bottom there's the bio and it also says like clinical psychologist practicing in New York. So some people more recently have started to find me through that. So in that case, I don't have to make a self-disclosure because they came to me in part because oftentimes they're artists or they're writers and they're and usually Middle Eastern or Arabic speaking. Um, and so they know that about me. So they've been pretty transparent in that case. I've had, you know, I've had everything from people like, emailing me poems and being like, love this poem that you wrote. And I'm like, we're going to talk about this next week. Um, so people just being like, we Google. I like, I Google. People are, for the most part, I think, honest. Um, I've more, I would say more people than not have just sort of said, like, you know, I, I looked you up and I saw these things. And, and I am, I mean, I think the greatest injustice I would do to my clients would be to not then have a conversation about it or to make it seem like it's something that we can't talk about in the room. So usually I'll just be like, what, what is it like for you? Like I, I certainly am more, have more visibility than, than other clinicians. There's more stuff that comes from me, right? That's out there, including interviews and things that people have written about me. Um, and so that whole idea of being maybe more of the blank shield, which I think is becoming more outdated anyway, personally, um, is, is more difficult in this sort of situation. So I would say I try to be as honest as I can and, and create a space where we can talk about what it means that that is part of my life.